Well, if you're uh, with us today, you can go ahead and have a seat. Ah, I threw you for a loop. I like it. See, you were predicting something else. Uh, we're going to kick off a new series uh, the next four weeks. It's uh, entitled Truish. And uh, if you're familiar with culture today, this term ish, this suffix ish we put on things, because uh, it can kind of be something and can kind of not be something. And uh, in Christianity, as uh, Pastor Dave and I were talking, we've done that to some of the words and some of the things that we're called to do as Christians. And so we're going to look at that uh, over the next four weeks. And uh, so we're going to start off with uh, one today, because here's the thing. Uh, as you can see on the screen, it, it talks about the fact of being black and white. And then in the middle is all this gray. And for some reason, a lot of times when it comes to things of Christianity, we like to think there's a lot of gray area. Uh, and we like to live in a lot of gray. And sometimes there's really not. And so we want to look at that. Uh, and if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. That's going to be the first place we start. And we're actually going to go through some different passages of Scripture today and, and really look out uh, what this means uh, as we kick off this series. And so hopefully as you go through this, uh, this series basically came about as we were discussing things, talking, and even some things in our own lives as we look at things we've dealt with, um, dealt with others as well. And so hopefully it'll be a time over the next four weeks where you reflect and do some self-evaluation as well. But let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer at this time. Dear God, we just thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here today, uh, God, to dive in your word. And as we were singing, God, you know, just uh, forever you are faithful. And because of that, you're worthy of praise because there is none like you. And uh, God, as we were singing, to love you with everything we have, God, that's the core of what we want to talk about today. Uh, because everything hinges uh, on our love for you. And so God, I pray that you take away the things that are in our minds. Uh, Lord, the plans we have for today, anything else that we may be thinking about, so we can fully give our attention to your word at this time. And that, uh, God, you will stir our hearts uh, over the course of today as well as this study as we look at uh, areas where maybe we're living in gray uh, instead of fully for you, or maybe we're living according to what the world says. So God, help us to reflect, to uh, evaluate our lives based on your word. And God, may we walk away today spurred for change as well. Uh, God, be before us now. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so today we're going to kick off this four-week series, and we're going to talk about love, but not that kind of love. So, um, but the idea of love, we're going to talk about what is that? Because so many people talk about love or use the word love. It's a word that's used with everything in our society. As a matter of fact, tell me, what do people love? Redskins, I love it, man, right off the bat. We had the Ravens last service, and I'm like, that's okay. I mean, they're in Maryland, but... Um, so what else do people love? Food. Yeah, food. And as we go through the service, your love for food will increase. Um, what else? Family, spouses, friends, sports. You guys are like the, the good crowd, man. You said like spouse, kids, friends. You know, everyone else is like food, sports, you know, their teams. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of things. So we take the word love and we put it with all kinds of different things. I thought about my own life. What are the things that I love? And so obviously the first thing I would say I love is my wife. Then after that I would say I love my kids. Uh, and then obviously family. But then I thought, what else do I say I love? Well, I love to cheer for certain sports teams. And I say I love sports. I love to play golf. Uh, I love to go backpacking and camping. Um, I love long walks on the beach. Um, I love reading. You know, whatever it may, I don't like long walks on the beach. I just like to plop on the beach. Um, but, you know, we say we love these things. And here's what saddens me. I think a lot of times when we say we love things and we love people, our love is really no different for either one uh, because we've cheapened that word tremendously. And so we're going to look a little bit about that because uh, there obviously has to be a difference in the way that we love if we call ourselves Christians. And so here's the whole thing, too. Our culture is in love with being in love. They are. If you don't believe me, if you were to Google the word love, you'd get 4.6 billion sites that deal with love. There's been over 1 billion songs written in over time that either express love or have love in the title. And then on top of that, there's over 15 million sites on the internet that deal with finding love or making love happen in your marriage. So I think it's safe to say our culture wants to know about love and what love is. And here's the great news. We have the answer today. And so as you look through that, you're going to find yourself in, in one of several areas when it comes to love. But knowing, knowing who we are, we are created to love. We seek that. Now, I know there's people who are hermits who completely withdraw in life. 
And that's probably because they were seeking love and couldn't find it, so they just went off on their own. But at the core of who we are, everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to have that. Uh, the problem is today is that most of the love that happen is, happens is conditional. Well, I'll love if I get A, B, C in return. I'll love if so-and-so does this for me. And so we want to look at that today, and uh, we're going to go through several things. And so the first thing we want to talk about is what is the problem with love today? And we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, here's the great thing about 2 Timothy chapter 3. Timothy's a young guy, and uh, Paul wrote this letter to him as he's at the church of Ephesus. And here's the thing. It says, it starts off and it says, in the last days, these things will take place. Now, there's two things there. Number one, it tells us it's going to happen later on. But number two, it's already taking place. And the one thing we know if you read the book of Revelation about the seven churches, Ephesus was criticized for leaving their first love. So it's kind of interesting that as he's writing this letter to Timothy, that love becomes the issue for the church in Ephesus. But let's start in verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and this is what it says. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. So it's interesting is Paul's writing to this young man, he talks about the topic of love several times. The first thing he says is that men will be lovers of self. I think it's safe to say if you look at our society today, most people love themselves. Most people are self-centered. Our culture tells us to be self-centered. Everything is directed to who we are as an individual. It's all about us. And therefore, we've bought into this lie, even as Christians, that I'm, in order to get something I want, I love someone else because it's all about me in return. And so really the problems that were going on hundreds of years ago are, have not changed. They're still here today. And so people are lovers of self. The second thing it says is they love money. Not our culture, is it? If anyone here works in finances or uh, debt services, you know that our country lives outside of our means. Our government lives outside of its means, so our people naturally do as well. And so we have this whole thing where people are lovers of money. They want more stuff, more things. They buy it. Uh, you know, people used to say keeping up with the Jones is whatever term you want to give to it. So I want more money so I can buy more stuff, so I can have more things, and you never have things. It's always interesting that and I've shared this before, but you'll buy something and you'll spend all this money on it because you know you need it, right, in that moment, and then you don't use it. And then you keep walking past it. Like, why do we ever buy that? Why do we spend all the money on that? And you walk by, you know, like, finally, you get rid of it. And what do you do? You put a sticker on it that's bright and it has money, and you set it in the driveway for someone else to buy at a cheaper value. But in that moment, you swore you needed it. And so that's what we do. We, we fall in love with stuff at times. The other one it says is that people are unloving. There are absolutely no unleave, unloving people in our society today, are there? Yep, they're everywhere. Uh, <laughs> there's unloving people everywhere. Uh, so people who are heartless, who, who don't express love to others. And then lastly, it says that people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And see, that's what we want to talk about because as we're going to define here shortly, uh, what is the difference between biblical love and worldly love? And right here, Paul says to Timothy, there's the love of pleasure, which is over here, and then over here is the love of God, which tells me there's a choice. And in Christianity, there's always a choice for something. And in this, uh, when we're looking at it, we have to ask this question. When did the issue of love ever become distorted? And naturally, we go back to Genesis chapter 3. And what happens is we know in Genesis 1, it says that God created all things, and then it says he created man. And it says that man was, uh, there was no helper suitable found amongst all creation, so man uh, received woman, therefore. And so here we see the portrait of love, of marriage, of uh, relationships between two human beings. But what we also need to understand in that is that Adam had a relationship, and even Eve, to an extent, had a relationship that was unlike anything that we will ever have with God. I mean, they walked through the garden with God. They had fellowship with God. We, we'll never comprehend the kind of relationship that Adam had. Now, we can blast them for it, for the decisions they made, but we'll never understand that. And so what we're told is that 
uh, God puts him in a garden, and in a smack dab in the middle of the garden, he put the knowledge of the tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's interesting, he didn't put it in the corner of the garden, he didn't put it by the entrance of the garden, he put it right in the middle of the garden. Why? Because any direction you come from, you're eventually going to see that tree. It was a reminder. But then it tells us in chapter 3 that the serpent, who was more crafty than all the other creatures, comes into the garden and deceives Adam and Eve. And it's interesting that he says, Behold, God knows that in the moment that you partake of the tree, you will be like him. And we know that they do that. They partake in the tree. What's interesting at that point, what did they do? They became lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure rather than good, and they became unloving towards everything else in creation. So really this problem doesn't go back just to an issue in Ephesus. This issue goes back to when man first started. This whole idea of love and struggling with what is love. And so as we look at this today, the next thing we need to do is Let's define biblically what love is. And the reason I say biblically is because a lot of Christians, as we interact with them, as we talk to people, as we counsel people, um, over the last several years as I've worked in leadership uh, positions in Christian ministries, I keep coming back to this topic and this whole idea of what biblical love is. And what you're going to find is there's a choice. There's a black and white when it comes to love. There is no gray area when it comes to love. But yet, as Christians, we've created a gray area in order to justify our own actions and what we do and how we live. And so we go to 1 John chapter 4, and this is where we're going to start, and we're going to look at several passages of Scripture, and biblically look at what is love. And then there's a question that I've been wrestling through, that I want to ask you guys as well, and I hope you wrestle through, and we're going to talk about what does this look like in our lives? What do we need to do? And so as we come to this uh, passage in 1 John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7, and we're going to just read through it, and then we're going to go back and highlight some points. But here's what it says starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God has manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he's given us of his spirit. Then in 17 it says, By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us us. Now, sometimes we read through passages of scripture and, and we look at them, but there's several important keys that we've got to pull apart as we look at this topic. Number one, love is a product of the Spirit. It is bestowed on us by the Spirit. Well, when does that happen? Well, Jesus, before he departed earth, promised us in John, he said, that, behold, I, my Father will send another to come after me, a comforter, who will be with you, which is the Holy Spirit. And so it's the Spirit living in us and directing our lives that allows us to love. Then beyond that, it says this, and this is really the core, because until you understand this, you cannot understand love. It says this in um, verse 9, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Uh, and it says in verse 10, He loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So the first thing you have to understand that love is, it's intrinsic in the character of God. So love can't be defined by an item, something you eat, somewhere you go, or even a person. It has to be defined by God. And it says in that same passage, it says, for God is love. So the essence and the character of God is love. And how did he do that? He sent the one thing that he cared about the most, the thing most important to him, as a sacrifice for all of us because of his love for us. And we're going to see how that plays out later in another passage of Scripture. And so what we're going to do today is kind of put the love puzzle together of what Christian love is really all about. And here's the reality of it. The fact is, it says that we are from God. He who knows God listens to us in verse 6. Uh, and then it goes down and it says uh, in verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Here's the reality. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you cannot truly love. I want you to hear that. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you cannot truly love someone else. And this statement I'm about to make will scare 
some of you to death, but it's true in the essence of Christ. When it comes to marriage, okay, most people uh, come before someone, they stand in a church, they take their vows, and they, they say, you know, I will be with you forever, I will love you forever. Here's the reality. If you sit down and you think about love from a biblical perspective, if two people get married and don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they really can't love each other. So you can get up every morning and say, I love you. You can kiss someone every night and say, I love you. But if you do not know Jesus Christ, you cannot know true love. And so when two people come together and they may not know Christ and say, you know, we love each other, in a worldly sense they do, but that's not true love. Because here's the reality. It says in his word in Ephesians that when we come together to get married, we're supposed to give up ourselves as husbands to our wives as Christ gave himself up for the church. How can someone who doesn't know Christ understand that? But yet, as Christians, we believe that that can happen. That we can love, we can love each other, that we can love our spouses, even our kids, with a love that doesn't exist. It's a worldly love, but it's a false love. And so anytime I talk to people and when we get to the issue of marriage, you know, I tell them, you know, without God, you can't truly love each other. You have to have God piece of it. And you have to pursue God. And so that's one of the things that look at. God is love. It is the essence of his character. And because of that, he gave us his son to die on the cross as a sign of him loving us. The other thing on top of that is it goes on and it says this. And here's, here's what's key. It says in verse 11, because if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Which means is our love can't be self-seeking. It can't be something we hold on to. It means we actually have to give our love to other people. And so you, it's not enough just to say, well, I love God. And you're going to look at it a second why that is. Uh, we have to show it to others. And here's why. In verse 12, it says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. What he's saying there is this. By the way you love God... And the way you love people as a result of that, people now have the opportunity to see who God is. So it's not about, as it says in 1 Corinthians, it's not about the uh, letters written on tablets of stone, but the letters written on our hearts. You know, the heart is the center of who we are. It's the wellspring of life. It's the one thing where we're supposed to partake in um, protecting God because it's, it's what drives us. And so whatever a man believes in his heart, he will live out. So when you look at yourself, when you evaluate yourself in the mirror, because this isn't one of those uh, messages where you're supposed to look around the room and go, you hear that? You've got to be more loving. No, you need to look in the mirror and say, how loving am I? I? How much am I really loving other people? Because at the core of it is, the more I love people, the more I love my wife, it isn't a matter of fact it's just about loving my wife, it's about loving God through my wife. And it's about other people seeing God by the way I love my wife. It's not about just telling my kids I love them, it's about me loving my kids in a way that people can see who God is because I love God. That's what drives everything we do or should drive everything we do because if love is at the center of who, Christ, who God is, then love has to be the center of who we are. It has to be what drives us. And so then it goes on and it says this, um, why do we love? Because he first loved us. It's like a reminder. Why are you supposed to do this? Because you were loved first. And here's the best part. We don't deserve it. There's nothing inside us that deserves what Jesus did on the cross for us. But yet he did. Why? Because he loved us. And that's what's so foreign to us as humans. Like, really? Someone's going to sacrifice themselves. And I know you're going to say, but we accept that. That's what faith is, and it is. But it goes against everything in our human nature to think you would sacrifice on behalf of someone else. You know, if someone said, Brian, you have to give it one of your kids for humanity. I don't love you guys enough. I'm sorry. This would be, I, I, that's, that's against my nature. You know, that's why the, the story of Abraham and Isaac is amazing to me that, you know, Abraham could take his son up there knowing full well, but you know what the amazing thing is? He loved God more than he loved his son. I struggle with that. I'm just being honest with you. It goes against everything in our nature to think I'd have to give up the thing that I care about most in order to, to love God, but that's what he calls us to do. And so in this passage of 1 John, he basically says, Everything that involves love comes from God. Because in the middle of his character, who he is in his nature is love. Everything God does is driven by his love for us. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is considered the love chapter. And in that, Paul writes things such as love is patient, love is kind, it is not arrogant, it is not boastful, it is not self-seeking, it keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, so when you look at that, 
You know, if you truly love someone, you don't keep bringing up everything else. When you forgive, you move on, because love, you don't keep a record of wrongs. Uh, it says it, it does not uh, enjoy the suffering of others. But then he closes it with this, and he says, Love hopes all things, love believes all things, love endures all things. In other words, love weathers the storms. Love can get you through everything. And not the type of love that the world is selling, but only the love that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And so when we're looking at this, how we define biblical love, it's simply this. Over here is biblical love. It means I love God. And as a result of loving God, I love other people and change. And we're going to talk about that further. Then over here, the world says, no, it's all about loving yourself. It's about getting what you want, getting something in return. It's about having what you want. And it's about seeking the pleasures of this world. That's love. So it's conditional. As long as I get something in return for my love over here, that is love. It's complete opposite when it comes to biblical love. You get nothing in return. You're not, you're not supposed to love in the hopes that someone will give something back to you or God will give something to you. And so the biggest difference is the world and biblical love is God. And people who don't know God can't know that love. But yet as Christians, we're trying to say, hey, you can love God and still love all this other stuff. And we really need to take a hard look at that today. And so th this question I want to ask you, and it's going to be on the screen, and we're going to spend the rest of our time really hitting this question. It's an important one. Is this. Can you say that you love God and yet have nothing change in your life? Can I say that I love God and yet have nothing change in my life? And here's why. If you're to go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, what are you called to love God with? Your heart, your soul, we just sang about it today. All right? And we did not coordinate that, by the way, which is funny. It just worked out that way. So you're called to love. And you know what's amazing is I, I sit back and, and there's times I sing the, that song or I watch others sing that and we're all into it. Yes, love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And yet, do we really love God with everything we have? Or is it just a fun song to sing at times? And what's the second thing he tells us to do in that passage is to love who? Your neighbors. Now, we agreed that there were unloving people. Let's assume this. <clears throat> Tomorrow, some of you are going to go to work, and there are people you do not like. That's just, I know that's a fact for some of you. Uh, some of you may go to a family function in the next few weeks or months, and you're going to have to sit across the table from people you do not like. Some of you are going to pull into your driveway today and look at the house of someone you cannot stand. Some of you are going to go to your kid's game and you're going to sit in the bleachers and stare fiery darts in the back of someone's head. Why? Because there are people we can't stand and we don't love them and they get under our skin. We've all had them or we all do have them. But here's what I've learned as I've gone through this study, as I've gone through this time of reflection in my own life. We're called to love God with everything we have. The more I love God and seek after God, you know what happens? I love people. It's amazing. Like, people I didn't think I could love, I can love now. I mean, it, there's just some people that are just hard to love. And I may be hard to love, I don't know. But, but... <laughs> I'm in my mind, I'm praying something bad happens to them. <laughs> just kidding. But anyways... That's what we do too, isn't it? It's like, dear God, don't change me, but whatever it takes to get a hold of that person, please do it, you know? But here's the reality. The more, we, the more I love people then, guess what happens? I love God. Why? Because the, we're in our character of who God is, he drives us to love if we're following him in the hopes that we'll share with other people. And the more I share with other people, I want to know more about God so I can share more with them and it becomes a cycle. And ever since I got that, ever since God has changed my heart, Man, I don't find myself not loving people. Now, I might get irritated with people, but I mean, there are some people I used to just not be able to stand. Like, their presence made me cringe. It's kind of like, think of it this way. This is the way to look at it. All right, this is God's love letter to us, correct? Yes. Good, we all agree with that. Um, here's, here's how you look at it. And, and younger ones in here won't get this because they text everything today. But when we were growing up, 
Do you remember when you had a crush on somebody in school? And you're in class and you're just like, oh, you're just thinking about them because they're not there. And then you get out of class and they walk by and there comes that really oddly shaped paper that they fold it. And guys are like, can't you just fold it one time and give it to me? And girls are like, I kissed it. And, <laughs> and, so, and so they pass that letter off to you and you get it and you're like, oh, I can't wait to read it. And, and we, you know, I'm, not, I'm just going to pick on girls for a second, but like a girl would read it and she's like, oh, read what he wrote. Oh my goodness. And you're so excited about it. You know, and the guy's like, yeah, man, I know. I'm the man, you know. And then they're like, and then they're all sitting trying to figure out how to put it back together, you know, because it looked really. So you got the, you're so excited. You got that love letter. You're so happy to have it. And, you know, you're, you just want to read it. And then you probably go home, you read it again. You're like, oh, man, this is, I can't wait to school tomorrow to see him again. And you write another one back and it goes on. And yeah, all the younger people are like, people wrote notes to each other. It's so weird. Yes, we did. All right. <clears throat> Hopefully you all got a chance to get a love letter growing up. No, some of you didn't. Sorry. <laughs> I did, but... So anyways, here, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Um, the other day we sat and we were going through stuff. I found all these cards that Krista wrote, wrote to me, like we were dating and all. It was so romantic. Like, I can't wait till I have you for the rest of my life. I'm like, it's touching, honey. You know, it was just, it was funny. Like, look what you wrote 11 years ago, honey. You know, you remember that? And it's, are you embarrassed yet? I can't imagine life without you. So anyways, but we get this love letter. We get all excited. But here's the thing. God gives us this love letter. He gives us this love letter, but we don't gush over it. Instead, we're like, yeah, that's nice. Imagine if we had the same passion, the same excitement about, man, look what God asked me to do. Oh, man, I just, I just want to know more about God. I want to study more about God. I want to live for God. I want to love God with everything I had. And then we go, hey, man, look what God wrote here. Isn't this so exciting? Imagine if we had the same passion and excitement over his love letter that we did over some love letter over some girl of God that we never even seen again. Now, some of you may have married that person. That's great. But most likely, you didn't marry the person who wrote you those letters that you gushed over. But yet here we have the love letter that can change our lives and change the lives of the world and instead we close it and we put it away. We don't get it out. You know, we get that love letter out in school and be like, man, I'm going to keep reading it and read it. You read it all day long. You had it memorized. You know, but yet here we have the word of God, the ultimate love letter given. It can change everyone's life and we don't gush over it. We don't love people enough to know it better so that we can live it out and change their lives. We don't want to know it well enough so that we can have a more intimate relationship with God. No, but we'll pursue, we'll pursue some acne-faced kid who we're in love with, with reckless abandon. But yet God, the creator of all the earth, we don't pursue. Isn't that messed up? You see how we make the world, the world allows us to believe, we define God by the love of the world. And it messes it up, it cheapens everything. Uh, you know, you look at it, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Shema, you know, the same thing, you know, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with everything you have. And then here's the other thing. It says you're supposed to impart that onto your kids. And so when it comes to this idea of love, we live in a society that is very unloving because we don't know how to love and we don't teach our kids how to love. And we talked about this the other week. Why don't we teach our kids how to love? Because we let them raise themselves. And here's the thing that's amazing. Kids want boundaries because in boundaries is love. You know how we know? Because Christ created boundaries for us because he loved us. He knew that we had to have parameters set up. And so when it comes to this whole idea of love, you know, don't treat it like some middle school relationship. Treat it like the best relationship you could ever have because here's the thing it says. You're supposed to be willing to give up everything, your family, your life, in order to follow after Jesus Christ. Not give up everything for your wife, not give everything up for your kids because guess what? They may be taken in a heartbeat, but your relationship with Christ goes on. And that's how it has to be our first love because until you love God, you can never love anyone else the way you're meant to love them. You can't. Go to John 15. I was reading this recently and, and this is where I want to spend the rest of our time and kind of talk through is, is John 15. And it, it's so important to see this as, as we're putting this puzzle of love together. In verse one, it says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
but every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. So what does it say there? Who is God? The vine. What are we? Branches. And what can't we do without him? Nothing. Bear fruit. You can do nothing without God. So guess what? Without God, you can't love. How do we know that? Well, Paul, who's a very intelligent man, he gave us an idea of what kind of fruit we should bear. In Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Okay, what was first? Love. You know what's amazing for that? Love, you know why Paul probably put that there? Because until you learn love, you can't do everything else. Until I learn to love God and learn others, I'll never be patient with people. Until I learn to love God, I can't have joy. Until I learn to love God, I can't show kindness. Until I learn to love, I can't do this. And what's the very last one he puts? Self-control. Isn't that interesting? At the bookends of the fruit of the Spirit is, you have to learn to love, and lastly, remind yourself, you have to learn how to control yourself. Because if you can't do those two things... You can't do everything else in between of it. You can't do it. It's impossible. And so in his wisdom, he said, look, you have to love everything and everyone the way that God has intended you to love, but practice self-control. Why? Well, because the biggest problem that gets in the way of us loving is who? Us. We either the ones that get in in, in trouble with that because we get in the way. And so here in John 15, he's saying, look, apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot bear fruit on your own. You can say you have love, But it's not the love that we're meant to have. You can say you have everything else, but unless you have God in your life, you can't have uh, bear fruit. And it goes on and says this. In verse 6, If anyone does not abide me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, that's where we really mess up the issue of love with God. Here's what we say. I'm a Christian. I've accepted Christ. Therefore, God should do things for me. And then we read verses like that, and I've heard people do it who claim to be Christians, and they say, all right, God, I want such and such a thing. I did this at the age of 16. Every every 16-year-old, I wanted a car. And I thought, I'm a Christian, I know God. God, I need a car. Guess what I didn't get? A car. So what does that tell me? God doesn't love me. Because he says, "If if I believe in him and abide in him, he will do whatever's asked of me. That's not what it's saying. But see, that's what we do with the love of God. We make it conditional. Well, God, I love you as long as you do this for me. And that's not what it is. As a matter of fact, it means you have to do the will of God. It doesn't mean whatever you wish. It has to be according to his will. Well, guess what? You're not going to know the will of God if you don't love God and pursue him. And so what happens is when someone's sick or there's some tragedy in your life, and trust me, this happens, you walk into the pastor's office or you talk to a friend, you'd say, well, why can't God change this for me? Because what happened was, we never fully loved God and pursued God, but now because we're in a desperate situation, we want him to love and do everything we ask. And when he doesn't, we say he doesn't love us. No, because it goes back to that idea of that middle school relationship. We did not pursue God the way we were intended to pursue him. But now because we need something, we want him to do what we ask. That's not how a love relationship works. It's not one way, God just does, 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 and we do nothing in return. No, it has to be two way. It has to be two way. It, it'd be kind of like getting married to Krista and saying, in front of everyone, we exchange our vows, and then we don't talk. We just live together. We don't ever talk. You know, what's going to happen in that relationship? It, it's exactly right. It's going to end. You know, there has to be communication that happens, but yet we treat, we say we love God, we say that he's our first love, we sing all these songs, but yet when it comes to our relationship with God, we never talk to him. We never spend time with him. But yet we expect full love in return. And therefore we cheapen and disgrace what he did on the cross. Because that was the ultimate measure of what love was. And every time that we do love differently than what he intends it, we cheapen the message of what was done on the cross. And so as we get back into 15, here's what it says in John. My father in verse 8 is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and therefore prove to be my disciples. Remember what it said in 1 John? 
because of his love manifested in us, people will be able to see who he is. Once again, the fact is, because we bear fruit, because we bear things as love, joy, whatever it may be, we prove to be his disciples. We prove who he is. And just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, therefore abide in my love. The whole idea of abide means we, we resonate, we, we stay close to, we stick to it. Uh, it's something that's important to us. But here, listen to what it says in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. All throughout Scripture, and we don't have time to look at all the passages today, our obedience is directly tied to our love for God. Our obedience is directly tied towards our love for God. So the reality is, if we truly love God, we will obey his commands and do those things. When we choose not to obey, when we choose to go against God's word and what it says, it's directly a result of our lack of love for God. But yet we want to put all the blame somewhere else. No, we have to just look at our hearts. We have to look in the mirror at ourselves. You know, he says it all through. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will do this. And the reality is, because we don't love God, we don't follow his commandments. It's a heart issue. And then he goes on and he says this in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that you may, uh, my joy may be made in you and enjoy, your joy may be made full. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But listen to this. This is com- my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Once again, that reminder. Oh, wait, I'm not just supposed to love God. I'm supposed to love everyone else as a result of God. And if you don't love people, you don't love God. That's the bottom line. And so therefore, it says, how are you supposed to love them? With the same love I have for you. And what was that love? It's the term agape, which is self-sacrificing love. It's the love that marriages are supposed to have. It's the love that we're supposed to have with every single person we come in contact with. Because he goes on and says this, greater love has no one than this, that you, one would lay down his life for his friends. What will you do? You will lay down your life for your friends. And then notice right away what he does, it says in the next verse. Greater, uh, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You'll lay down your life for your friends, and now he addresses you as my friends. I lay down my life for you. You are my friends. Therefore, do what I have commanded you to do. If you love me, do what I ask you to do. Isn't it interesting when he asked Peter at the end of John, when he wants him to lead the disciples, what was the question he asked him? Do you love me? He asked him three times. Do you love me, Peter? Because Peter said before he did, didn't he? Oh, Jesus, I will never deny who you are. But yet, in the moment got tough, he turned his back because he was self-seeking. It was more about protecting himself rather than standing up for who he believed in and what he believed for. And therefore, he says, do you love me, John? Yes, why do you, I repeat, why do you ask? Yes, I love you. The question is today, do we really love God? Not saying we love God, but do we really love God? Do we love him enough to obey his commandments? Do we love him enough to pursue him every day with our lives? Do we love him enough to share about him with others? Because here's the reality when it comes down to it. John 13, 34, 35 says this, A new commandment I give you is that you will love one another as I have loved you. And all men will know your disciples by the way you love one another. Once again. Here's what happens. We come to this gray area and we're like, Yeah, I love God. Kind of. And what you're really saying is, you're trying to say, oh yeah, I love God. But really what you're saying is, I only love God when it works because I love this too. It's a love-ish. Other people. Yeah, I love people the way God says. Then someone torques you and gets you really mad and you're like, yeah, I kind of love them. There is no kind of love with God. There is no gray area with his love. Imagine... Let me ask you this question. How many of you have sinned this week? Okay? None of you deserve the love of God. According to the way you define love. He should walk away from you right now. And that's what happens. It happens in marriages. Uh, people come in and they say, you know, I'm done. I've had it. I, I'm out. I don't want this anymore. And the first question I ask is, do you profess to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Okay. So what you're telling me is, Ephesians chapter 5, let's read it together, says that I'm supposed to treat you the way that Christ treats the church, correct? Yes. And I understand there's reasons that people can get divorced. I get that. But I'm just saying, in our society, the way we define love. Okay, according to what you just said, that we're supposed to love our spouse the way that Christ loved the church. So what you're telling me is, 
Uh, over here in First John, let's read it together, that Christ's love is manifested through us, and that's how pe- people see Christ. And it also says in John 13 and John 15 that by the way we love one another, people will know we are his disciples, correct? Yes. So what you're telling me is that if you walk away from your marriage right now, you are telling everyone who knows that you are a Christian and profess that you follow Christ, that at the moment that things get too tough, Christ will walk away from you. Well, I didn't look at it that way. Well, that's how you need to look at it, because it's exactly what you're saying. Because the love of Christ doesn't mean when it gets hard, I walk away. It doesn't mean I give up on somebody. It means I go after God more in the hopes of going after them more with love. And so what, what we have today is, is this hard issue. There is, no, there is no gray area where I can kind of love people and kind of love God. It doesn't exist. You either have to decide, I'm going to love God, I'm going to love people the way God wants me to the way he calls me to, the way his word says. And how do you know that? You spend time in his word. He tells you how to do it. Holy smokes, but what about that coworker tomorrow? Well, here's the best part about it. He says because of his love for that person and because of your love, you got to pray for him. you got to bless him. Not, dear God, I pray they get their fingers stuck in the machine and they learn a lesson. <laughs> Teach them something. No, you have to say, God, give me an opportunity to show who you are through my actions and what I say. Yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor Brian. They're the most miserable person ever. And you know what? They're just like you because there's nothing righteous, not anything in us that deserves God. But God saw fit to forgive you. Why can't you forgive and love that person? So when it comes to loving God and loving people, there is no gray area. You either have to choose God or you have to come over here and choose what the world says. You can't marry the two. But yeah, that's what we try to do. And so over the next few weeks, you're going to hear as we talk about things like contentment, uh, being honest as Christians, it all goes back to we can't do certain things because we've totally messed up the definition of biblical love. We try to say, well, I kind of love God and I kind of love things. You can't. It messes everything up, as we talked about today. So as you walk away today, here's my challenge to you. Do some self-reflecting. Ask yourself, how does my life look in regards to love? Because here's the thing. The question I just asked you was this. Can you say that you love God your life not changed? The answer is no. It's impossible. And here's why. At the age of five, there was a vacation Bible school happening in Hagerstown, Maryland, and a story of Noah's Ark was shared. At the middle of the premise of animals going into the Ark, a little boy raised his hand and said, I want to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was a weird kid. I'd have no idea. You know, something motivated me about Noah's Ark. And so I went out and talked with the youth pastor. I answered all his questions. The teacher sat down. She prayed with me. Over the next 12 years of my life, I did this. Sunday mornings and Wednesdays. Oh, I love God. Yeah, I love people. And the rest of the week, eh, I kind of love this over here. And so I was kind of like, yeah, I kind of have a love. But nothing ever changed in me. I never had this euphoric moment, you know, no glow, no, ah, it never happened. So here I am going through life, making stupid choices, making poor choices with friends, doing things I shouldn't do, you know, putting my mom through uh, misery because of choices I'd make. And then all of a sudden, I go on a mission trip at the age of 17. And here I am at the end of the summer, sitting on the sandy beaches of California. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Except all I'm doing is sitting there thinking, my whole world's been turned upside down this summer. Over the last few weeks, I've seen things and experienced things and been places I never thought I would be, seen God do things I never thought could be done, changing lives that I thought could never be changed. And I remember sitting there, and I was sharing with our student staff at our retreat this weekend. The first night, they make you do a heart search. Well, I didn't go to California to see God. I went to California to see the beach and girls. I'm not going to lie. So, but I'm sitting there doing this heart search, and I'm thinking, I do not deserve to be here. I should not be where I'm at. And yet, over the course of the next six weeks, God revealed himself to me in a way I had never seen. And as I sat on the beach there at Huntington Beach, California, I remember saying... God, I don't know what this means, and I don't, it scares me to death, but I'm yours. Take me, use me however you see fit. And the last 18 years has been an awesome trip on an intimate relationship with God. And the reason for that is, is because I finally understood what it meant to love God. See, I used to say, well, yeah, I love God, but I still love the pleasure. Remember what I said? You love pleasure rather than God? I was still in love with that. Until you start getting rid of what the world gives you and you pursue God, your relationship with God's never going to change. You're never really going to have one with him because he can't be secondary. And so I can tell you as living proof, you have to pursue God. You have to fall in love with him, pursue him with everything you have. Because without him, you can't be different. 
And so if you're sitting there today, there's, you're probably in one of three areas. Number one, you may be on fire for God, in love with God, passionately pursuing Him. It doesn't mean you won't sin. It doesn't mean you won't fail. But when you do, you know where you go back and get things right. You may be there. Great. Then there's some of you who are sitting there today going, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never even heard of such a thing. It's just foreign to me. Maybe, and this, this whole idea of love is just foreign because you don't know God personally and you need to have a relationship. But then there could be a good percentage of you. And I say a good percentage because of my dealings with people. I've come to find that a lot of people like this gray area, the, the ish. And you're like, uh, Pastor Brian, yeah, I love God, but anytime you say I love God, but you don't love God. And so you have to do some self-reflecting and change things. And so I, whatever you're at today, you know, everything else we talk about, until you understand the love of God and what he did on the cross and by sending his son, the rest of his love letter will never make sense. Because everything he did was driven by his love for us and the hopes of changing our lives. Let's pray.